Welcome to Double Deal, a series about organized crime in 20th century Boston. The stories of our central character, Richard Tchaikovsky. The criminals, the crimes, and the law enforcement officers who ruled the streets. Nina and I will be your guides through the darkest streets of Boston, telling you the true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies. Hi all, we're back. When we left you in episode 8, Dad had just been released from prison, only to find himself back in handcuffs. Fats Buccelli had been murdered earlier that morning, and Richie was at the top of the suspects list. Luckily for Richie, he had an ironclad alibi. He was still in custody, being processed for release at the time of Fats' killing. The authorities had to release him, but life would never be the same for him. Fats' murder was never resolved. There were endless theories that it was a sanctioned hit on orders of Raymond Patriarca, that it was over the Brinks heist, or that leaders of the narcotics ring that he had been convicted with took him out. Buccelli was found at 3 a.m. on June 19, 1958. His car was rammed into the rear end of another parked car. When he was first found, they thought that he had had a heart attack while driving. But he had been shot once behind the ear and once in the back of his head, indicating that whoever shot him was sitting behind him in the back seat of his vehicle. The window of the driver's side was smashed to bits, but they never determined whether it was because he was shot through the window or a shot was fired from inside the vehicle. Fats had been released from Deer Island exactly one month prior. If you've been listening in, you'll remember that he received a two-year sentence for being in possession of $57,000 of the Brinks heist loot, but he wasn't out scot-free. He was convicted of being part of a $20 million narcotics ring. The judge sentenced him to five years in prison in April of the same year, but he was free on $15,000 bail pending appeal. That seems very strange. Fetz was accused of using the coal wharf as the drop point for the narcotics shipments. To add to the madness, Johnny Earl was killed the day before in New York City. A well-dressed hitman shot Earl three times at point-blank range. Earl was an associate of Elmer Trigger Burke, as was Fats. If you recall from episode three, Elmer was hired to take out Specky O'Keefe and later escaped from the Charles Street Jail. One of the other motives thrown around was that it was revenge for Mesty being blinded and disfigured in prison. Since Bobby was in protective custody, Fats was considered an alternate target, hence why Dad made it to the top of the list of initial suspects. That is one of the stupidest hypotheses I've ever heard, and we've heard some pretty idiotic ones over the years. I could see if they'd said Richie went after Fats because Bobby put him away in the away for no reason, but who really cared about Mesty? Nobody was going to take revenge for him, especially because everyone knew it was Jimmy Flemmy who attacked him. Hello. I still think the New York crew took Fats out. While the investigation into his murder continued, Dad spent the next few weeks relaxing at home. They were still living on Barton Street in the West End at that time. When he had his fill of Grandma's cooking, people in and out of their apartment drinking and playing cards, Dad was back hanging around Ralphie's. I think we should talk about Ralphie and his place in organized crime. I agree with you. We've both come to the same conclusion as to what we think brought so much heat on Dad. Why don't you start with some basics about Ralphie's background? Ralph Lamatina was born July 10, 1922, the oldest child of Anthony Lamatina and Rose Siciliano. Vinnie Teresa claimed that Anthony Lamatina was a don in the Boston Mafia. Born in central Sicily in 1899, his family arrived in the United States in 1901. Anthony joined the U.S. Navy at 17 and served as chief petty officer on the USS South Carolina. He was honorably discharged in 1919. Lamatina worked for the U.S. Postal Service from 1933 to 1953. He was active in civic matters after his retirement until he passed away in 1978. It sounds like a completely normal family for a mob family. Maybe there is some weight to Teresa's statement about Vinny, about Anthony. But Vinny was such a liar. On the other hand, with two sons growing up to be in the mob, one who becomes a Don himself, does leave room for doubt about, quote unquote, normal. Hey, did you know that Ralphie was arrested for the Brinks heist on January 18th, 1950? Who wasn't picked up for the Brinks heist? But that's probably another reason why Rico was squeezing Richie when he got arrested in March of 57. I was thinking the same thing. Ralphie was released shortly after that, but he was picked up again on March 6th. According to the FBI 302s, Ralphie wouldn't tell them anything, nothing about his activities, his income, or how he existed. An informant in Philadelphia told the feds that Ralphie had killed George R. Colleen on May 20th, 1950. The BPD said that the killing was the result of an argument over a girl. Not the only time that someone was killed over a woman in this story. Nope. 
the BPD said that Ralphie was involved in illegal gambling. We know that Richie was working for the dice games at Ralphie's club. They also claim that Ralphie was a loan shark. And a stalker for Johnny Williams. What's that? It's Yiddish for a tough guy, you know, an enforcer, a leg breaker. Ah, uh, got it. Before we move on, I want to talk about the Colleen killing for a minute. He was also a suspect in the Brinks case and had been questioned multiple times from January until being shot in the head in front of Volley's restaurant in the North End. No one was ever tried for his murder. One of many on that list. The cops thought that Amato Sandiniello was involved initially, but eventually had to drop the charges after witnesses failed to identify him six months later. The police thought that it was strange that Colleen was at Valley's at all. It was not his usual hangout. Back to Ralphie. His record stretched back to September 10th, 1942. He made 13 court appearances between then and April 8th, 1949. The charges ranged from motor vehicle violations to illegal gambling, but he was never sentenced to any jail time. Still don't think Anthony LaMatina was a big shot in the mafia? Well. By 1957 and Richie's first arrest, Ralphie was on the FBI's radar for narcotics trafficking. Another Philadelphia informant was providing that information. Ralphie was also believed to be the owner of the Coliseum restaurant. Who the hell wasn't believed to be one of the owners of the Coliseum? Another one of those endless lists. After the Appalachian meeting, one of the attendees, Frank Valenti, was found to be in possession of a business card from the Coliseum restaurant. Fast forward to September 3, 1958, a subpoena was issued for the phone records of Victor Calamaro, a close associate of Angelo Bruno, head of the Philadelphia family. A phone call was placed from Calamaro's home to Ralphie's unlisted home phone number. Ralphie was described by the Philadelphia FBI as an associate of Johnny Williams in Williams' cigarette vending machine company, r &L Vending. To top that off, during a search of Angelo Bruno's office, the same unlisted phone number of Ralphie's was found in Bruno's address book. From that point on, the heat was on Ralphie and everyone connected to him. I don't think anyone in Boston realized that it was Ralphie's connection to Angelo Bruno that was putting them under a microscope. For those who aren't familiar with who Angelo Bruno was, he was the boss of the Philadelphia family from 1959 until his unsanctioned murder in 1980. Nina, do you have a little bit of background on Bruno? Of course I do. Angelo Bruno was born on May 21st, 1910 in Villalba, Caltanissetta, Sicily. He emigrated under the name Anna Loro as a baby, but if you follow his immigration papers and the FBI 302s, his real name, according to the Italian National Police, was Antonio Angelo Cumella, the son of Michaela and Vincenza Cumella. The stepdad's surname was Anna Laura, but he soon changed it to Bruno, and Angelo did the same. He was definitely a powerful figure, and his reach went way beyond Philadelphia. Back in Boston, things weren't the same in the North End. The scene was drastically changed. Fewer people were coming to the dice games. The heat on Ralphie's place had been too much for the regulars. Ralphie had been brought in for questioning several times in the fall of 1958 in regards to his connection with Bruno. Heroin use had spread across the city, and the feds were starting to take notice. Fats wasn't the only one suspected of running narcotics. Ralphie was also on the Fed's radar for narco narcotics trafficking. But no one had any idea it was because of an informant all the way in Philadelphia. Did you ever figure out who the informant was? Nope. I've rifled through all of the 302s we have on Bruno, and I can't figure it out. Well, if it's out there, we'll find it. So what did Richie end up doing? He continued to work for Ralphie and two bookies until he crossed paths with Jack Kelly again in early 1961. Jack had recently been released from prison and was putting together a new crew. I know who they were. Sonny D'Affario, Mello Merlino, Roy Appleton, Tommy Richards, and Richie. Exactly. But Dad was still wrapped up with Ralphie moving drugs. The first robbery that I know of for sure was the Garden City Trust on Route 9 in Chestnut Hill. The story always stuck in my head. I was fascinated by the idea that they broke into a bank overnight and waited for the bank to open. Eavesdropping little me was dying to ask more questions or at least pick up little more bits of info. This was a very intriguing case. The same bank had been robbed by three men in August of 1960 for $6,000. Frederick Valdinelli was arrested in October of 1960, but I couldn't find anything else about the case. But did you know that Budinelli testified against Sonny and Kavanaugh in the Elmer Trigger Burke escape case? He was in Charles Street Jail waiting trial at the time. I had no clue, but who wasn't locked up in Charles Street at that time? It was like fucking Grand Central Station over there. Anyhow, on Monday, November 20th, 1961, at 8 a.m. that morning, when the first employees entered the bank, they were greeted by three men in masks wearing identical raincoats. Two were armed with submachine guns and one with a pistol. 
They had gained entrance to the bank by Mello driving the car up to the teller window while they climbed onto the roof of the car and then through an unlocked window on the second floor. That reminds me of the Sturdivant job in 1947. The employees said that they thought the men had come in from the third floor offices. Another job more likely Jack than Sammy Granito. Poor Sammy Granito. Back to Garden City Trust in 1961. When the guard entered the bank, Tommy Richards was crouched in the corner pointing a submachine gun at him. One of the employees told the guard that it wasn't a joke and to do what they said. At that moment, Richie appeared from behind the teller's desk brandishing a handgun. Shortly after the guard arrived, the bank manager entered through the rear door and went straight to his office only to find Jack waiting there for him. They rounded up the four employees and set them down in the stairwell. Jack demanded that the bank manager, Joseph Bayer, open the safe while Tommy and Richie watched the employees and complained about being cold all night. Naturally, they did. <laughs> that poor bank manager. He was there during the robbery the year before. Jack stuffed pillowcases with money from the vault. At that point, he took Bayer's keys. The other employees, along with Bayer, were locked in the vault. They used Bayer's car as their getaway vehicle. The car was abandoned at the old Bacon Estate in Jamaica Plain, just a short distance from where Dad was then living on the Jamaica Way. No one was ever arrested for the robbery, but things weren't going as smoothly as they seemed. In September of that year, a fight broke out over a woman at an end of the summer party in Salisbury Beach. I don't want to get into detail here, as we'll be doing an episode dedicated to the McLean McLaughlin War and how it allegedly started, and its aftermath will be played out through season one. As we mentioned in a previous episode, the McLean McLaughlin War wasn't just between the immediate gang members. Practically every organized crime player picked a side, and so did at least one agent of the Boston FBI office. Richie was spending more and more of his time with Jack, honing his driving skills and learning from his mentor. On March 30th, 1962, they hit the Essex Trust Bank in West Lynn. Once again, it was Tommy, Jack, and Richie. This time, Richie was at the wheel while Jack and Tommy entered the bank. It seems to me that Jack was training Tommy and Richie as they were less experienced in armed robbery. Well, at least in Richie's case. I agree with you. As we've mentioned before, Tommy had been out with Jack prior to Jack going away for the Harvard Trust robbery, but Dad was strictly a hustler before teaming up with Jack. I have my theories as to how Jack decided on his dream team. Mello and Sonny were seasoned thieves. If any of you listened to the Bobsy Twins episode, you might remember that Sonny and Mello had records for robbery going back to their early teens. They were the kind of guys who had the nerve for armed robbery, the ability to play the heavies. Dad had an amazing memory, calm to the last breath, and the ability to think quickly. Roy was the analyst and the armorer, and Tommy possessed the physical strength to do any of the heavy lugging. Before we get into the Essex Trust robbery, maybe we should talk a little bit about Tommy since we didn't cover him in previous episodes. Sure. I wanted to give Tommy his own episode, but since he was, you know, for the most part, a clean-cut guy, there just wasn't enough for a standalone episode. Okay, tell us a little bit about Tommy's background. Tommy was born Thomas R. Bagdadlion on September 29, 1925 in the Bronx to Mary and Richard. Richard Bagdadlion was a tailor. The family left New York in the late 20s, first moving to Watertown and then to Quincy by the early 30s, and later in 1940 to Weymouth, where Richard owned a tailor shop called Dick's. At the time of his draft card, Tommy was working at the Bethlehem Hingham sh Shipyard. Shortly after, in late 43, he enlisted in the Navy. When he got out of the service, he briefly worked for Jack's stepdad before taking a job with the electric company. He got married in 1954. Sometime after that, he started using his middle name Richard as a surname, eventually adding an S to the end. Tommy will be making many appearances throughout the season. At least now everyone knows how he fits into the picture. Okay, back to the Essex Trust Bank robbery. As I mentioned earlier, on March 30th, 1962, the Essex Trust Company in West Lynn was robbed. Things didn't go quite as planned this time. When Jack and Tommy entered the bank, there were 24 people inside, 10 tellers and 14 customers. Tommy didn't say anything, just fired a single shot into the ceiling. As you know by now, this was something unheard of in any of Jack's robberies. The timing was off. An armored car pickup had happened a few minutes before, so instead of getting $60,000, they ended up with only $28,000. Boston traffic had struck again. Well, it didn't get better. As they fled the scene with Dad behind the wheel, the cops were in pursuit. A total of 50 cruisers from seven cities and towns were on their tail. Shots were being fired in both directions. 
Tommy fired his gun out the rear window at the police cruiser trailing them. He fired a second shot that went through the windshield of the cop's car and grazed the driver's arm. The other cop started firing back at this point. He smashed out their back window before they got to Saugus. Tommy kept shooting back at them through the smashed window. At least two of his shots went wild and struck two parked cars. The chase went through North Revere to Route C1 and then onto the Northeast Expressway. At the entrance to the Mystic Bridge in Chelsea, they shook the cops. They crossed over the Chelsea-Everett line onto Summer Street near Ferry Street in Everett. There they commandeered a laundry truck by pulling out of a driveway and blocking it. They held the driver at gunpoint, threw him in the back of the truck with three bags of dirty laundry on top of him. Jack drove the truck to Roxbury, where Tommy got out. He drove a little further and dropped off Richie near Faulkner Hospital. Once again, a short walk home for Dad. Really, he didn't like to walk, even when fleeing a crime, obviously. Later, before there was a drive through at Starbucks, he had his own car side delivery service set up. He had a list of cell phone numbers for all the employees and would call one of them to bring his coffee out to the car. I used to go nuts. Dad would tell me, why should I wait in line like everyone else? I never waited in line in my life. I tip them more for a cup of coffee than they make in an hour. I can't. <laughs> Back in 1962 and before Starbucks was even a thing, Jack was still working on his own escape plan. He abandoned the truck with the driver still in it somewhere near Roxbury Crossing. He yelled back to the driver to stay where he was. The driver waited a few minutes before cautiously getting out and heading to the closest police station. After that fiasco, Jack and his crew laid low for a while, but not Dad. Sometime in May, Richie went on a different kind of mission. This time, he was transporting weapons to the McLaughlins as the gang war was starting to heat up. Dad was driving to Charlestown when he first saw a light flashing behind him. First one cruiser, then a second, and a third. At first, he thought it was maybe a speed trap, even though he hadn't gone over the limit. He pulled over and parked on the side of the road. The first man approached the vehicle. It was Stady, Lieutenant Cornelius Crowley, the same Lieutenant Crowley from the DeSisto case. It was a BPD detective also, but it was the third man who approached the vehicle that left him numb, Special Agent H. Paul Rico. The handguns in the trunk of the car wouldn't have been a problem, but the machine guns meant life in prison. When he was brought in, Rico took Richie into an interrogation room and his deal with the devil was made. Now, you can't tell me that someone didn't finger Richie. He had been out for almost four years, and other than his arrest the day he was released, he hadn't been picked up once. I agree with you, but the question is, who was it? We hate to leave you hanging, but if you want to find out what Richie's deal with Rico was, then you'll have to wait until episode 15. Next week, we will be going back in time to the early 20th century in Boston when the Black Hand or Camorra ruled the streets, the arrival of the Sicilian Dons, and the transition to the rule of Raymond Patriarca. We hope you listen in. Plugging time. Please leave us a review or rating and share with your friends. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Double Deal, true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies.